What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be talking about the U.S. versus Maxwell case once again. And I got another update for you guys regarding uh, what the judge has determined regarding some of the witnesses that were uh, proposed by the defense. So last week, I believe, I made a video about some of the witnesses that are going to be uh, put forth, some expert witnesses that are going to be put forth by the defense. And uh, one of those include Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, who's a so-called memory expert, who's going to be talking about how memories can change over time and even fake memories can be planted due to suggestion. So she's basically being brought forth by the Maxwell side to discredit the uh, memories of the victims because some of this stuff happened a long time ago. And you can you can probably tell what they're planning here. And I explained that in my last video. I'll link that in the top right-hand corner if you want to go check it out. But the uh, latest legal news is that the judge has basically uh, said, not, not in specific details, but she has said that the uh, that Dr. Dietz and... Um, Dr. Uh, Loftus can testify. Dr. Dietz was another expert that we talked about in the last video, but the main person we're going to be focusing on this video is Dr. Loftus and her theories, and I'm going to give you guys my opinion on, on what I think about them based on a uh, layperson's analysis of this memory science stuff that she's talking about, and it's not that difficult to evaluate if you ask me. But anyways, the judge didn't put out exact details on what she's allowing and disallowing, but she basically said that, that um, the government's motions are granted in some places and denied in others. Um, if I had to guess, I would say she's going to probably limit Dr. Loftus's commentary on memory and try to, and tell her to keep it more general and not specific because she's not she has not talked to these victims. She has not studied them. So she doesn't have any specific things to say. But the defense ha does have a right to, you know, present experts that are generally accepted by the scientific community or uh, or somewhat accepted by the scientific community and not, you know, uh, regarded as kooks. And this Loftus person seems to be accepted. She works for a reputable, a reputable university. So technically speaking, she is an expert in her field. So the defense has a right to present their case and have reasonable experts present. And that's what was determined by the Daubert uh, hearing that took place that we talked about in a couple of videos ago. Uh, related to that Daubert hearing was the evaluation of Dr. Lisa Rocio. So Gil and Maxwell's lawyers tried to prevent Dr. Rocio from testifying because they didn't like what she had to say about grooming. We talked about that. I, I dedicated a whole video, two videos to her. Um, and I'll link those in the top right hand corner as well if you want to go check them out. Um, but so the Daubert hearing wasn't just for evaluating Lisa Rocio. It was also for evaluating Dr. Dietz and Dr. Um, Dr. Loftus and other people as well. So like I said, most likely the judge is going to allow Dr. Loftus to testify, but keep her testimony more general than specific, because like I said, she has not examined Annie Farmer and the rest of the victims of Gil and Maxwell, so she can't offer ex specific testimony regarding the truthfulness or falseness of uh, their memory specifically, but in general, she can talk about how memories can be affected over time and how, may how they may change, okay? So most likely, that's what she's going to be saying at trial, and uh, like I said, the defense does has, ha, have a right to present their own experts and try to uh, construct a theory of their defense. They have a right to defend themselves, Gil and Maxwell. Now, whether the jury buys that or not is up to them. Uh, they have to evaluate the uh, evaluate the experts that are presented and determine who is most likely telling the truth and whose, um, uh, you know, framing of the events that took place in this case with Gillian Maxwell is more believable. The jury is going to make their determination based on who they find to be more credible, right? The experts experts present, presented by the government or the experts presented by the defense and the testimony of the victims are also going to, co going to come into play and whether they think that Annie Farmer and the rest of the girls are believable. That's going to affect their decisions as well. But in this video, we're going to specifically focus on Dr. Loftus because she's going to be a key witness here. She has testified uh, in the defense of Harvey Weinstein and uh, some other people who are distasteful, like uh, what was his name? Sandusky was another person that she testified for. So she's somebody who believes that the uh, the, the defendants, the alleged criminals, should have a fair representation in court. That's why she is a defense witness for the most part, right? I think I don't think she's ever testified for the prosecution. She's always testified for the defense. So she is a civil libertarian, it seems like. 
like, which is fine. I I, I agree. Uh, even though I, in general, I'm I'm for the prosecution because I'm on the side of the victims. But nevertheless, I do want the defendants to have a fair trial, which is why I've made several videos saying that some of the treatment of Gillian Maxwell in prison is unreasonable, like the 15 minute searches. There's no reason for you to do that. You're just doing cruel and unusual punishment, which is um, illegal under the Eighth Amendment. So I believe in the Constitution. I can I can uh, I can sympathize with where she's coming from, but. But what I would say regarding her scientific testimony is that it's kind of bullshit, okay? It's, I would say it's 90% BS and 10% true. That's my analysis as a layperson. And just before we jump into the uh, the analysis of uh, Dr. Loftus here, through an article that was written by uh, somebody who actually interviewed her and got these uh, some of these quotes directly from her, uh, we're going to be looking at that. I'm going to be evaluating and, and breaking down exactly what she's all about for you guys. But I just want to say in the beginning, before you listen to my analysis here, I am not an expert in memory science. I'm not I'm not an expert in psychology. I'm not an expert in psychiatry. I'm, I'm, my expertise lies with the biological sciences uh, in microbiology, evolutionary biology, and and uh, our physical anthropology. Um, I've done. I've worked in the lab for my in a microbiology lab. I've worked in a DNA sequencing lab. So I have that experience, which is completely different from psychology and other social sciences. So I've, I have a background in the physical sciences. I'm a microbiologist. That's my training. I've been trained in the lab. I also worked in uh, DNA analysis as well. Uh, I also have, ex just for reference, I also have expertise in um, some astronomy and, and cosmology as well. When it comes to the uh, what happened right after the Big Bang, um, the uh, fundamental force of the universe, standard model of uh, quantum mechanics, and, uh, and uh, when it comes to planet formation in the early universe, uh, galaxy formation in the early universe and star formation in the early universe. I've studied in detail things like uh, gravitational lensing and uh, supernovas and pulsars, things like this, because I want to be an astronomer for a while. So I have this uh, that expertise as well. And I have a lot of other general knowledge about astronomy and cosmology. But when it comes to uh, when it comes to psychology and psychiatry, I am not an expert. So I just want to say that uh, up front that my analysis is of a layperson simply using the science that I know from the uh, fields that I just mentioned and also just common sense and my own anecdotal evidence from my own memory, which I'm going to be telling you guys about as we go through this. So just want to say, because I want to respect people and their fields, and I want to tell you guys before I tell you, before you listen to my analysis, that I'm not an expert. This is a lay person's opinion and analysis, and there's not much law here. This is simply, I'm simply going to be going through what she claims regarding memory. Okay, so, so let's get started here. So we're not going to go through all of this we're gonna i have highlighted some parts that i want to cover for you guys basically dr loftus and some other people in the psychological community want to challenge the very understanding that the lay person's understanding of memory okay so this is what she uh, this is what this author talks about here so dr loftus is a professor at the university of california irvine which is a reputable organization uh, is the most influential female psychologist of the 20th century according to the list of list compiled by the review of general psychology well, influential doesn't necessarily mean that everything that she's saying is true. So most influential psychologist doesn't mean that she's accurate in her theories. And I'm going to be poking holes in her theories, uh, like I said before. So uh, let's keep on going. Her work helped usher in a paradigm shift regarding obsolete and archival model of memory. The idea dominant for, the, for much of the 20th century that our memories exist in some sort of mental library as literal representations of past events. According to Dr. Loftus, uh, who has published 24 books and more than 600 papers, memories are reconstructed, not replayed. Quote, our representation of the past takes on a living, shifting reality. Quote, it is not fixed and immutable, not a place way back there that is uh, preserved in stone, but a living, living thing that changes shape, expands, shrinks, and expands again, an amoeba-like creature. So you guys get it. This paragraph basically sums up her entire outlook, which is that she's trying to discredit the idea that our brains um, store memories like a computer. OK, this is an attack on that uh, hard drive like memory idea, which is something that I actually do believe in. Now, like I said, I think most 90 percent of what she says is BS and 10 percent is true. Now, is it true that that our memories can change in, in, you know, small different ways here and there? Maybe you forget 
the uh, street that you grew up on, but you remember uh, the other general details of your childhood, but you forget like, you know, exactly what street it was, exactly what the house number was, exactly what the co color of your fence was. So things like this, that can shift. And I'll give you some examples. So I don't remember much from my childhood, but I do remember the house that I grew up in. So I lived in Orange County, as I talked about before. So I recently went back, la uh, back in 2019, I went back to Orange County where I grew up, uh, to the house in Loma Linda where I grew up. And I, and I don't, you know, obviously I don't live there anymore and the house is occupied by other people. But, um, but when I, when I looked at the house, my memory of the house is not the same as what it is now. Now, the people have not repainted or done anything, but when, from uh, the memories that I have when I was a kid, everything appeared bigger and, and brighter. That's one thing I remember that's changed as an adult. The walls are not the same color that they were back then when I was a kid. Now, you might say, hey, maybe they repainted. No, they didn't. They're pictures of the house that I have from when I was a kid, and uh, the walls look exactly the same now as they did back then. So my memory in my head, when I think back to the memories that I have in the house, the walls are like a white, bright white color and they're, everything is bigger. Now, obviously, I was a kid, so that might be why it's, uh, things seem smaller now. Now I'm like 5'10". Back then, I was like much, much shorter than that when I was like five, six years old uh, when I remember this stuff from. So, so things like that can change, right? The way, way buildings look, even the way that people look, um, like some people that, that I remember, they look like their their skin tone, their complexion looks lighter than they are now. Like when I look at pictures of people that I knew, they were actually tan, but I remember them as being like palish. So small details like that can shift. But the like I remember falling, for example, while playing baseball or throwing a football, almost getting hit by a car. Those memories, they actually did happen, right? There's like th this her idea that fundamental parts of our memory can just shift because, you know, I heard a news story or I, heard, I saw I saw uh, a, a movie or a TV show. That That's what she's trying to say. She's trying to say that suggestion as an adult can completely shift your memories when you were a kid. The, re the representations of what happened to you when you were a kid can completely change and you can just start producing false memories because you were suggested to do so. And she bases all of this on ridiculous experiments that she's done that other people have tried to discredit, I think uh, rightfully so. So let's take a look at some of the stuff that she's saying and some of the so-called evidence that she presents. And we're going to be poking holes in this stuff, okay? So Loftus, who is 76, adopts uh, the a view of what I just talked about, about memory, seizing any opportunity to elaborate on what she calls the flimsy curtain that separates our imagination and our memory. So she's basically trying to say that nobody's memory of what they remember is actually true and that you might, your entire identification of yourself, like what, what happened to you during your childhood kind of shapes who you are. So she's trying to say that most of what you know about yourself from when you were a kid and when you were a teenager is a bunch of bullshit. That's what she's selling here. And I'm not buying any of it. Like I said, I, I will admit that small details can shift over time because you know, your perception as a kid is not the same as the perception as an adult. So like I said, you know, the color of the walls might change, the color of the, uh, the uh, look of the people back then might change, small details like that may change. But the fundamental things that happened to you, like being abused by Jeffrey Epstein, that's not something you're going to forget. Okay. So like I said, 10% um, buy it, 90% don't buy it, think it's BS. Okay, let's move on to, uh, let's actually look at some of the people that she's testified for. Bill Cosby, guilty. Jerry Sandusky, guilty. The, the lacrosse team, I think they, they were found innocent. I'm not exactly sure about the, uh, the results of the case there. I didn't study the case, so I can't say for sure. Bill Cosby is definitely guilty. Jerry Sandusky was also convicted. Bill Cosby's uh, uh, conviction was overturned because of a technicality, because the DA in Montgomery County, um, Pennsylvania, made a mistake, and they offered him a non-prosecution, verbal non-prosecution deal, which then was violated by the DA's office, so it was a mess. But nevertheless, we all know that Bill Cosby is guilty. Harvey Weinstein is also guilty. There was audio of him going after a woman with Harvey Weinstein. So in my mind, Harvey Weinstein is guilty 100%. So most of the people that she's represented or tried to defend, they're guilty. Okay. Once in a while, she might have an innocent person, but most of the time, 
they're guilty because the most of the time the cops and the prosecutors get it right. But sometimes prosecutors and, and the police do make mistakes. It's not as bad as people might uh, portray it. OK, P certain people on the left and in the right want to uh, want to convince people that our justice system doesn't work. They are liars. Ninety nine percent of the time, the justice system works and the one one percent of the time where innocent people get convicted. That's a sad thing. But nevertheless, we have the best justice system that the world has has ever had. We give more chances for the defense to protect themselves and for criminals to walk away than any other country. The criminals have more rights than the victims. That's the way it's designed by Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, all the people who designed our constitution. They constructed our jurisprudence and our constitution so that the people who are accused of crimes can have every single opportunity to get to uh, prove their innocence. OK, so by its very design, our constitution and our jurisprudence is designed to give as many opportunities possible to the defense. So, so people who are trying to discredit America by saying that our justice system doesn't work, they're liars. OK, yes, the police make mistakes. Yes, prosecutors make mistakes. But those mistakes that are made are unfortunate, but they're nothing compared to the general outcome of the legal system, which is that guilty people go in jail and they are removed from society. So overall, the legal system works. People are trying to convince you that it doesn't are liars just based on statistics and the numbers. OK, I myself have had a shift in what I think about the police and prosecutors in the last year. I used to unfortunately listen to idiots like Jimmy Dore who don't know anything about the law. And I've actually studied the law for myself over the last two years. And uh, I've come to the conclusions that I've come to after analyzing all the relevant evidence. OK, the justice system works and uh, that's a bottom line. And I don't necessarily have a problem with uh, Dr. Elizabeth, you know, uh, speaking up for the defense. I think that, you know, both sides need to have their expert witnesses. And if she cares about civil liberties so much, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. OK, so she in this article, they go on to talk about how um, how she first refused to defend uh, Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein. But then she was convinced to do so after being offered. Uh, how much was it? Fourteen thousand uh, dollars. Oh, she was only paid ten thousand dollars of it. But uh, she seemed like it seems like she actually believes what she's saying. So I don't even though I personally don't buy into her analysis of how flimsy human memory is, she seems to believe in what she's saying. So she's not a charlatan. She actually believes what she's saying and she believes that memories can be easily affected. And that's why she's offering this testimony at trial. She resisted the job regarding Harvey Weinstein for about four months. But Weinstein and his lawyers eventually prevailed, persuading her to fly to New York and testify on his behalf in exchange for fourteen thousand dollars. She only got $10,000 of that. And what she claims she does is present basic psychological evidence um, to help the defense. OK, so this is what they say. She testified for roughly an hour in the Harvey Weinstein case, presenting basic psychological research that might lead a jury to think that neutral or disappointing sexual encounters with Weinstein could have taken on new weight in light of revelations about his predatory history. Quote, if you are being urged to remember more, Loftus said, at trial, you may produce something like a guess or a thought, and that then can start to feel like it's a memory. So this is why I completely disagree with her. The idea that these girls had some kind of confusion and she they, they had consensual sex, but then they start to misinterpret. This is the you know go to move for any abuser to say that their victim actually wanted it, but then later regretted it. This is this is this is kind of what she's pushing here. It's it's a little bit different and it's she's not, you know, she's not the predator herself, but she's offering a narrative that predators and their lawyers usually offer. So that so, you know, I think she actually believes what she's saying because she's really tied to this idea that human memory is really, really bad. So that's why she's that's why she's pushing this. So I don't even though it's the same kind of thinking, she's not doing it because she wants to help out predators. She's doing it because she actually believes this nonsense. OK. All right. Now let's move on to some of the uh, so-called evidence that she has for this idea that memories are so untrustworthy. Quote, if you label something, this is her speaking, if you label something in a particular way, you can distort memory of that item. You can plant entire events into the minds of otherwise ordinary, healthy people. She explained that in one of her experiments, uh, her most famous study, uh, she had convinced adults that as young children, they were they had been lost in a mall crying. Quote, the emotion is no guarantee that you are dealing with an authentic memory. So. So she did some hypothetical experiment where she convinced a bunch of adults that they were lost in a mall crying 
as children. And this is her evidence that the, fa the fact that she was able to convince people of this is her evidence that memories can change and that ideas, false ideas can be planted. OK, first of all, I don't believe that this experiment actually worked the way she says you got adults to believe that they were in a mall and crying when they actually weren't. And how does she know that these people weren't actually lost in a mall crying? Because that's a very common occurrence. And the assistant district attorney, uh, Joan Luzzi, who was who was in the Harvey Weinstein trial, went on to challenge her stupid experiments or her so-called scientific experiments, saying the following. Um, ADA Joan Eluzzi challenged the idea that experiments done in a pretend situation, quote unquote, free of context, stripped from gender and power dynamics are relevant to understanding trauma. That's exactly right. So most Harvey Weinstein had enormous power over the women that he was abusing. OK, and that traumatic experience that stays with you. I don't care what anybody says about memory. OK, I'm not a memory expert, but I don't have to be. I think it's common sense that traumatic experiences are seared into your brain. OK, like I said, small details here and there might change. But the general memory of being attacked by this fat, disgusting slob, Harvey Weinstein, that is not something you forget. OK, and the idea of trying to say that it was consensual is just disgusting. So. This is what this is what Aluzi, the DA uh, in this trial, in the uh, Harvey Weinstein trial, asked her some of the questions that I that I want to cover for you guys. Quote, you do not treat victims of traumatic events. Is that right? I may study them, uh, but I do not treat anyone officially. So she doesn't even she's never even treated trauma victims. Uh, the other expert that the government is bringing regarding grooming, Dr. Lisa, uh, Lisa Rocio, she has actually treated victims of uh, sexual assault. So this woman has no personal experience dealing with trauma victims. That's why she that's why she has no problem defending rapists and, and pedophiles and sex traffickers, whatever. Right. Um, so that's part of it. Like if you don't have personal experience experience with victims, then you might not understand how badly damaged they are and you might not sympathize with them right now people who do talk to them might over sympathize so it can go both ways i want to be fair but nevertheless if you if you haven't if you don't have any experience talking to victims of these this kind of abuse then you're missing half the story she's out here defending criminals alleged criminals but she doesn't have the story of the victims uh the da went on to say and isn't it true in 1991 that the name of your book was witness for the defense she literally wrote a book called witness for the defense <laughs> Quote, this is what she says, uh, Dr. Loftus, one of my books is called Witness for the Defense. Now, the DA then asks, quote, do you have a book called Witness for the Prosecution? <laughs> a few people in the courtroom laughed like I just did. And Loftus goes on to say, no, calmly. And she that was uh, that was her interaction with the DA, one of one of the interactions uh, with the DA during the Harvey Weinstein trial. And you can see where she's coming from. OK, she has identified with criminals and with alleged criminals. And she her, her job, she's she's lending her expertise and her knowledge, however valid that is, to defending alleged criminals because she believes that they deserve a fair trial. That's a fair position to have, but that doesn't mean that the judge or the jury should take her seriously because I think her scientific ideas, scientific ideas are very suspect. Okay. All right. Moving on, they go on to complain about how uh, one of her colleagues at, at her school, U.S. Irvine, basically dissed her because she was testifying for Harvey Weinstein, saying the following, Harvey Weinstein, how could you? That's apparently what one of her colleagues said to her. And she got mad at that. And she she went on to turn it around and say, how could you uh, saying, quote, I was reeling. How about the presumption of innocence? How about the unpopular uh, deserve to have a defense? Well, nobody's uh, nobody's saying that people who are, you know, uh, alleged to have committed a crime don't defend, don't uh, don't deserve a defense. Of course they do. She doesn't seem to care much about the victim. I'm just saying I'm not saying that she's evil. People, some people focus on the victim. Some people focus on focus on the defendant. So she wants to focus on the defendant and making sure that he or she has the best defense. And that's fair. That's part of our legal system. So like I said i'm not demonizing her for that but there are people you're gonna have to expect that some people are not going to be okay with you defending harvey weinstein so don't whine about the fact that people were disappointed with you and by the way she never got kicked out of her school she never got canceled so a bunch of law students um told the administration to get rid of her because her her uh anti-survivor mentality is harmful guess what they didn't get rid of her the students asked loftus to be removed from the faculty but she continues to teach so she was never canceled so she shouldn't be whining about the fact that some people 
people who are unhappy, you should expect that. Okay. If you think you're doing the right thing, who cares? There's some people who don't like some of my commentary when it comes to some issues. Um, but I don't really care because this is my uh, genuine belief. Okay. And like I said, she was not canceled. She still, she still has a job. She's still regarded as um, a somewhat of an expert in her field and uh, she's respected in her field. Okay. A lot of people are not happy with her, especially people in the Me Too movement and uh, feminists and other people who are, who care more about the victims and the defendants. But um, nevertheless, she has not been uh, financially uh, hurt by it. She's still getting, you know, she's still uh, getting money to testify for defendants. She still has a job, so she's still publishing papers. So nothing has nothing has happened to her. So the reason I wanted to make this video is to give my opinion regarding her ridiculous theories on memory. So f when I first talked about her, I didn't want to talk about this because I hadn't looked into what she was talking about. Like, what kind of memory expert is she? Um, so from what I can tell, it, it's like half and half. So, so a lot of people in the psych psychology community uh, accept her ideas. They think that there's a lot of problems with human memory, and I I think there are too, but not to the extent that she, she's saying. From what I can tell, it's divided. A lot of people support her ideas. A lot of people disagree with her ideas within the psychology and psychiatry community, okay? Because everybody knows, I mean, it's just a fact that human memory is not perfect, okay? We forget things here and there. Sometimes we do, um, we do uh, like replace, th replace one detail with another detail. But my problem is that she's trying to use the general frailties in human Human memory, take that and weaponize it against victims of these kinds of uh, sexual assaults that happened by these prominent men. Okay, that's that's why some people, not me, I think she's actually honest about what she's saying, but some people think that she's just doing this for money and just because she's trying she was trying to make money from these rich guys who have lawyers that she knows are gonna hire her to give testimony. That's another perspective. Now, I personally think that she actually believes this nonsense about how human memories are completely untrustworthy and you can, you know, plant memories left and right in human in human brains. I just don't buy that because I because aside from the astronomy stuff and the micro Neurology stuff. I've also studied neurology. Okay, that's how I know neuroscience to be specific. fMRIs, functional MRIs, where we can actually see the brain doing its thing. So I know about how you know what parts of the brain are responsible for what, and the amygdala and the fear impulse and the way that people misremember things. Sometimes eyewitness testimony sometimes is flawed when certain circumstances are present. So it's not completely untrue what she's saying, but she's taking some scientific, some established neuroscientific and uh, psychological facts and she's expanding it to say that all of human memory is untrustworthy and especially when you have victims of uh, sex assault and trauma even though she has she doesn't work with trauma victims okay i don't know like like i said she ran some a couple experiments here and there and wrote a couple of books a lot of books but nevertheless her experimental experimental um expertise is very lacking she doesn't she doesn't even talk to victims of sexual assault. She just ran some random experiments asking a hypothetical question of people, and she claims that she planted memories in them, and therefore she's saying that human memory is flawed. I'm, I'm just not buying it. I'm just not buying it. But like I said in the beginning, I am a layperson here. I am not a memory expert. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Okay, I have other scientific expertise, but not in memory. So take this video with a grain of salt. You can trust my side or you can trust her side, but my, my takeaway from her expert testimony is that the defense should be able to present her, but the jury should have a lot of skepticism regarding her stupid theories, because I do think they're stupid. And I think she's taking uh, true facts of science and expanding them way beyond their, uh, their extension. Okay. That's what I think she's doing. So I'm sure the judge will be fair. I trust judge Nathan to do the right thing. And if she decided to allow this person to testify, I'm sure she'll curate the testimony fairly. Uh, she's going to say, you can talk about this, but you can't talk about that. So I trust Judge Nathan. I'm not really worried about the legal part here, but I just want to tell you guys that I'm not buying her bullshit about how me human memory can't be trusted. That's all I wanted to say in this video. All right, guys. So that's all I got to say for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press all for my future videos. I will be doing daily coverage of the Gill and Maxwell trial when it starts. So make sure you're subscribed and you're, um, you hit the bell so you get all my videos. Otherwise, YouTube will not notify you. And if you like my content and you enjoy watching, do not be a freeloader. The uh, Making this content takes a lot of time. The research that I put into it takes a lot of time. So if you like my content, please support my work on Patreon. You can do so for $1 five dollar ten dollar whatever you think is appropriate if you get some kind of value from my content then please consider supporting me because that's the only way that i can keep running this channel
okay so you can do that on patreon there'll be a link in the description box and in the end of the video during the credits with that being said i'll see you guys next time as always peace if we press a case that we can't win we just tell the next victim that she's better off staying silent if we let Dastasio walk, we send a message to the rest of the world that in New York, the law doesn't apply to the rich and the powerful. We are here to even those scales, not cut and run. <laughs>